Morning folks, John McNamara, your Wilbur Ellis agronomist here at the Plattsmouth, Nebraska location. Wanted to kind of give you a little update as far as what our plot system is looking like, uh, things that we've observed so far as we've gotten this far into July, given today's July 18th. Uh, and really across all of Nebraska, or the Corn Bolt for that matter, one of the bigger pictures in dry land farming is you reach this time of year, this time of development within the corn, how much soil moisture do you have left? So a couple things that we want to kind of cover this morning. We've set up the plots first and foremost to be as static as possible, meaning that you can come in and look at our plot down here at the Minard location uh, at your convenience. You can look at not only developmental differences between the hybrids, but also we've given you a little bit of a product placement update on yield as far as what we know, how it's historically performed, that type of thing. That's the idea behind the minor plots to make it as static as possible. I encourage you to do that. Come in and look, make your own decisions as we progress through the rest of the summer. One of the bigger questions that we've gotten here in the last week to 10 days, now that we're in this uh, little bit of a heat uh, dome that seems to be lasting for the next week to 10 days into August, is how much soil moisture do you have left? Okay, so why is that important? Corn right now, post-pollination, is trying to use about a quarter to 30 hundredths transpired through the plant on a daily basis. Corn can root to three feet, but most of the nutrition and water uptakes in the top 18 inches of the root mass. Why is that important? Well, after pollination, we're trying to hold on to those developing kernels. And how you know pollination is complete is once you reach dry brown silk. When you look at these hybrids, you've got a corn ear that is not entirely pollinated, but the lower silks or the butt of the cob has already, has already fertilized those kernels. And you can know that by shucking it back and you can kind of see that once those kernels pop out, they're, to they're totally fertilized. These at the tip are just kind of at right at the end of that. Again, it all boils back down to where you're at from a moisture uptake standpoint. And so we do various things to try to measure that in dry land farming. You can do this via a postal auger. You can do this via a soil probe, if you will. You can do this the way I do it, primarily through a tile spade. So this tile spade from the top of the blade to the tip is 16 inches deep. Remember what we talked about most of the actions in the top 18 inches. So if I get down roughly about 14 inches or so and try to bring the tip of that blade up to kind of get an idea as far as where you're at from a moisture standpoint. This is obviously dry, but at the tip, can you make a ball? And this is used mainly for soil texture. Most of the soils that we have here in Cass County, Nebraska are of the silty clay loam variety. Uh, but what, you're, what I'm trying to do is squeeze and maintain that ribbon and make that ball. When you have that residue of the soil or a little bit of mud on the palm of your hand like that, that tells me that I'm still above 50% of the soil moisture water holding capacity of the soil at tile spade deep, about 14 inches. Now you get beyond that, it's bound to be a little wetter. Uh, which is a good thing because at this stage of the game, we're again transpiring a quarter to 30 hundredths a day. So this is important because it is not uncommon this time of year to see corn roll or you'll see that gray cast to it and it's wrapped up in the heat of the day. The main thing is that as long as it's unfurls the next morning, we're still okay from a water uptake standpoint. If it doesn't unfurl the next morning, that's where we typically run into trouble uh, from a standpoint of now we're truly impacting yield if we're that short on moisture. So quick tip as far as what you can do to get kind of a handle on where you're at from a soil moisture standpoint. So another thing that we try to uh, demonstrate on an annual basis, folks, is things that are genetic based, things that are maybe trait based, things that are somewhat weather-based. And this year, as well as what we found last year, is a couple of things for uh, observation in mid-July. So 
at our soybean trial up here on Highway 66, um, you're going to see a number of things. Um, one thing that is fairly consistent between all maturities, and we've got a difference of from a basically a 2.7 bean out here to a 4.1. Uh, we have a uh, an assembly of traits that include uh, some of the ExtendFlex products, some of the Enlist products, uh, E3 products and also with some of the competitors. And you can kind of see how these things are reacting not only to the weather, but also some of our practices that we've used. So a little background on the plot. Uh, the only thing that this thing has been sprayed with post-emergence is a Liberty-based product. It's a glufosinate-based product. Um, but you're gonna see a varying degree of differences as far as how these soybeans are reacting. So if you kind of walk down through the plot, and you can kind of look from right to left uh, from a standpoint of not only height difference, but also how they're reacting. Maybe it's weather, maybe it's drift, but geez, these things look bad. They're cupped, they're kind of rolled over. They have that silver look to it. And historically, when we talk about cupped beans, we're worried about off-target movement, whether it's from maybe a 2,4-D based product or possibly a dicamba based product. This is not drift. Drift follows a pattern such that if these beans were spayed with dicamba and these are exhibiting some sort of dicamba cupping, the injury should be most prevalent closest to where the application was made, right here. If you look across this from right to left and all the way down through the run, the injury is kind of exhibiting the same symptomology. It's all kind of the same. Now, if you also look at if it truly was a uh, herbicide problem, you'd see some of these weeds that are starting to come back would be exhibiting some of that cupping or dying process that dicamba goes through when it's trying to kill off weeds. So from this standpoint, you know, where is this going to go? Again, probably more dependent upon what the weather systems are going to do here through the rest of July and into August, and we talk about August being the month that soybeans are made. Their water and nutritional uptake are maximized at that stage of development. Last year when this occurred, we had sufficient rains in August that the impact from the cupping and kind of the things that don't look quite right were minimized rain help that out. If it stays hot and dry, the chances of, the, the chances of this having lingering effect on the developing soybeans, I would think, would be increased. But here again, it bears watching. So if we turn around and look at a different perspective of it, um, you can kind of see the, the back and the front of what these things look like. And if you want to go left to right or right to left out here at the minor plot, you can kind of see the same things. You can pick out differences in trait package of how they react. Some are cupped, some aren't. It's an eye-catching thing. Does it mean anything in the end? Well, we'll find out. But here again, we set this up with the customer in mind to let you come out here and, and evaluate these things uh, throughout the rest of the summer. And then we will follow this up with yield data come October.